Mr. Harrigan's phone, part four. No, I said. No is a mistake you don't want to make, the kid said. You better effing believe it. Boys, say boys. Is there a problem here? It was Mrs. Harginson, my earth science teacher. She was young and pretty, couldn't have been long out of college, but she had an air of confidence about her that said she took no shit. The big boy took his head. No problem here. All good, I said, handing the bag back to its owner. What's your name, Miss Harginson said. She wasn't looking at me. Kenny Anko. And what's in your bag, Kenny? Nothing. It wouldn't be an initiation kit, would it? No, he said. I gotta go to class. I did too. The crowd of kids going downstairs was thinning out, and pretty soon the bell was going to ring. I'm sure you do, Kenny, but one more second. She switched her attention to me. Craig, right? Yes, ma'am. What's in that bag, Craig? I'm curious. I thought of telling her, not out of any Boy Scout honesty is the best policy bullshit, but because he had scared me and now I was pissed off. And, might as well admit it, because I had an adult here to run interference. Then I thought, how did Mr. Harrigan handle this? Would he snitch? The rest of his lunch, I said, half a sandwich. He asked me if I wanted it. If she had taken the bag and looked inside, we both knew we would have been in trouble, but she didn't, although I bet she knew. She just told us to get to class and went clicking away on her medium just right for school heels. I started down the stairs and Kenny Anko grabbed me again. You should have shinned him, new boy. Or shined him, new boy. That pissed me off more. I just saved your ass. You should be saying thank you. He flushed, which did not compliment all those erupting volcanoes on his face. You should have shined him. He started away, then turned back, still holding his stupid paper bag. F your thanks, new boy, and F you. A week later, Kenny Anko got into it with Mr. Arsenal, the woodshop teacher, and hucked a hand sander at him. Kenny had had no less than three suspensions during his two years at Gates Falls Middle. After my confrontation with him at the top of the stairs, I found out he was sort of a legend, and that was the last straw. He was expelled, and I thought my problems with him were over. Like most small-town schools, Gates Falls Middle was very big on traditions. Dress Up Fridays was just one of many. There was carrying the boot, which meant standing in front of the IGA and asking for contributions to the fire department, and doing the mile, running around the gym 20 times in phys ed, and singing the school song at the monthly assemblies. Another of these traditions was the autumn dance, a Sadie Hawkins kind of deal where the girls were supposed to ask the boys. Margie Washburn asked me, and of course I said yes, because I wanted to go on being friends with her even though I didn't like her, you know, that way. I asked my dad to drive us, which he was more than happy to do. Regina Michaels asked Billy Bogan, so it was a double date. It was especially good because Regina whispered to me in a study hall that she'd only asked Billy because he was my friend. I had a hell of a good time until the first intermission when I left the gym to offload some of the punch I'd put away. I got as far as the boys' room door, then someone seized me by the belt with one hand and the back of my neck with the other and propelled me straight down the hall to the side exit that gave on the faculty parking lot. If I hadn't put out a hand to shove the crash bar, Kenny would have run me into the door face first. I have total recall of what followed. I have no idea why the bad memories of childhood and early adolescence are so clear. I only know they are, and this is a very bad memory. The night air was shockingly cold after the heat of the gym, not to mention the humidity exuded by all those adolescent fruiting bodies. I could see moonlight gleaming on the chrome of the two parked cars belonging to that night's chaperones, Mr. Taylor and Miss Harginson. New teachers got stuck chaperoning because it was, you guessed it, a GFMS tradition. I could hear exhaust banging away through some car's shot muffler up on Highway 96, and I could feel the hot, raw scrape of my palms when Kenny Anko pushed me down on the parking lot pavement. Now get up, he said. You got a job to do. I got up. I looked at my palms and saw they were bleeding. There was a bag sitting on one of the parked cars. He took it and held it out. Shine my boots. Do that, and we'll call it square. F you, I said, and punched him in the eye. Total recall, okay? I can remember every time he hit me, five blows and all. I can remember how the last one drove me back against the cinder block wall of the building and how I told my legs to hold me up and they declined. I just slid slowly down until my butt was on the macadam. I can remember the black-eyed peas, faint but audible, doing boom, boom, pow. I can remember Kenny standing over me, breathing hard and saying, tell anyone and you're dead. But all of the things I can remember, the one I recall best and treasure is the sublime and savage satisfaction I felt when my fist connected with his face. It was the only one I got in, but it was a hell of a shot. Boom, boom, pow. When he was gone, I took my phone out of my pocket. After making sure it wasn't broken, I called Billy. It was all I could think of to do. He answered on the third ring, shouted to be heard over the chanting of Flo Rida. I told him to come outside and bring Miss Harginson. I didn't want to involve a teacher, but even with my chimes rung pretty good, I knew that was bound to happen eventually, so it seemed best to do it from the jump. I thought it was the way Mr. Harrigan would have handled it. 
Why? What's up, dude? Some kid beat me up, I said. I don't think I better go back inside. I don't look so great. He came out three minutes later, not only with Miss Harginson, but Regina and Margie. My friends stared with dismay at my split lip and bloody nose. My clothes were also speckled with blood, and my shirt, brand new, was torn. Come with me, Miss Harginson said. She didn't seem upset by the blood, the bruise on my cheek, or the way my mouth was fattening up. All of you. I don't want to go in there, I said, meaning back into the gym annex. I don't want to get stared at. Don't blame you, she said. This way. She led us to an entrance that said staff only, used a key to let us in, and took us to the teacher's room. It wasn't exactly luxurious. I'd seen better furniture out on Harlow lawns when people had yard sales, but there were chairs and I sat in one. She found a first aid kit and sent Regina into the bathroom to get a cold washcloth to put on my nose, which she said didn't look broken. Regina came back looking impressed. There's a Vita hand cream in there. It's mine, Miss Harginson said. Have some if you want. Put this on your nose, Craig. Hold it. Who brought you kids? Craig's dad, Margie said. She was looking around at this undiscovered country with wide eyes. Since it was clear I wasn't going to die, she was cataloging everything for later discussion with her gal pals. Call him, Miss Har Harginson said. Give Margie your phone, Craig. Margie called Dad and told him to come pick us up. He said something. Margie listened, then said, well, there was a little trouble. Listen some more. Um, well. Billy took the phone. He got beat up, but he's okay. Listened and held out the phone. He wants to talk to you. Of course he did. And after asking if I was all right, he wanted to know who had done it. I said I didn't know, but thought it was a high school kid who might have been trying to crash the dance. I'm all right, Dad. Let's not make a big deal of this, okay? He said it was a big deal. I said it wasn't. He said it was. We went around like that. Then he sighed and said he'd be the, there as fast as he could. I ended the call. Miss Harginson said, I'm not supposed to dispense anything for pain. Only the school, school nurse can do that. And only then with parental per permission. But she's not here, so. She grabbed her purse, which is hanging on a hook with her coat, and peered inside. Are any of you kids going to tell on me and maybe cause me to lose my job? My three friends shook their heads. So did I, but gingerly. Kenny had caught me with a pretty good roundhouse to the left temple. I hoped the bullying bastard had hurt his hand. Miss Harginson brought out a little bottle of a leave. My private stock. Billy, get him some water. Billy brought me a Dixie cup. I swallowed the pill and felt better immediately. Such is the power of suggestion, especially when the one doing the suggesting is a gorgeous young, wo young woman. You three make like bees and buzz, Miss Harginson said. Billy, go in the gym and tell Mr. Taylor I'll be back in 10 minutes. Girls, go outside and wait for Craig's father. Wave him over to the staff door. They went. Miss Harginson leaned over me close enough so I could smell her perfume, which was wonderful. I fell in love with her. I knew it was sappy, but couldn't help it. She held up two fingers. Please tell me you don't see three or four. No, just two. Okay, she straightened up. Was it Yanko? It was, wasn't it? No. Do I look stupid? Tell me the truth. How she looked was beautiful, but I could hardly say that. No, you don't look stupid, but it wasn't Kenny, which is good, because, see, if it was him, I'd bet he'd get arrested, because he's already expelled. Then there's a, there'd be a trial, and I'd have to go in court and tell how he beat me up. Everyone would know. Think how embarrassing that would be. And if he beats up somebody else? I thought of Mr. Harrigan, then. Channeled him. You could even say, that's the problem. All I care is that he's done with me. She tried to scowl. Her lips curved in a big smile instead, and I fell more in love with her than ever. That's cold. I just want to get along, I said, which was the God's honest truth. You know what, Craig? I think you will. When my dad got there, he looked me over and complimented Miss Harginson on her work. I was a prize fight cut man in my last life, she said. That made him laugh. Neither of them suggested a trip to the emergency room, which was a relief. Dad took the four of us home, so we missed the second half of the dance, but none of us minded. Billy, Margie, and Regina had had an experience more interesting than waving their hands in the air to Beyonce and Jay-Z. As for me, I kept reliving the satisfying shock that had gone up my arm when my fist connected with Kenny Anko's eye. It was going to have a splendid shiner, and I wondered how he'd explain it. Duh, I ran into a door. Duh, I ran into a wall. Duh. When we were back at the house, Dad asked me again if I knew what he had done. I said I didn't. Not sure I believe that, son. I said nothing. You just want to let this go. Is that what I'm hearing? I nodded. All right, he said. I guess I get it. I was young once myself. That's a thing parents always tell their kids sooner or later, but I doubt if any of them believe it. I believe it, I said, and I did, although it was amusing to visualize my father as a five-foot-five shrimp squeak back in the age of landlines. Tell me one thing, at least. Your mother would be mad at me for even asking, but since she's not here, did you hit him back? Yes, only once, but it was a good one. That made him grin. Okay, but you need to understand that if he comes after you again, it's going to be a police matter. Are we clear? I said we were. Your teacher, I like her, said I should keep you up at least an hour and make sure you don't go all woozy. Want a piece of pie? Sure. A cup of tea to go with it? Absolutely. So we had pie and big mugs of tea, and Dad told me stories that weren't about party telephone lines or going to one-room school 
where there was just a wood stove for heat, or TVs that only got the three stations, and none, of, none at all if the wind blew down the roof an antenna. He told me about how he and Roy DeWitt found some fireworks in Roy's cellar, and when they shot them off, one went into Frank Driscoll's kindling box and set it on fire, and Frank Driscoll said if they didn't cut him a cord of wood, he'd tell their parents. He told me about how his mother overheard him call old Philly Lou Bird from Chilo Church, Big Chief Wampum, and washed his mouth out with soap, ignoring his promises to never say anything like that again. He told me about fights at the Auburn Rollerdrome, Rumbles he called them, where the kids from Lisbon High and those from Edward Little, Dad's school, got into it just about every Friday night. He told me about getting his bathing suit pulled off by a couple of big kids at White's Beach. I walked home with my towel wrapped around me, and the time some kid chased him down Carbine Street in Castle Rock with a baseball bat. He said I put a hickey on his sister, which I never did. He really had been at Young Ones. I went upstairs to my room feeling good, but the leave Miss Harginson had given me was wearing off, and by the time I got undressed, the good feeling was wearing off with it. I was pretty sure Kenny Yanko wouldn't come back on me, but not positive. What if his friends started getting on his case about the Shiner? Teasing him about it, laughing about it even. What if he got pissed and decided round two was in order? If that happened, I would most likely not even get in one good blow. The shot to his eye had been kind of a sucker punch after all. He could put me in the hospital or worse. I washed my face very gently, brushed my teeth, got into bed, turned off the light, and then just lay there, reliving what had happened. The shock of being grabbed from behind and shoved down the hallway, being punched in the chest, being punched in the mouth, telling my legs to hold me up and my legs saying maybe later. Once I was in the dark, it seemed more and more likely that Kenny wasn't done with me. Logical even, the way things lost lots crazier than that seem logical when it's dark and you're alone. So I turned on the light again and, Mr. Har and called Mr. Harrigan. I never expected to hear his voice. I only wanted to pretend I was talking to him. What I expected was silence or a recorded message telling me the number I'd call was no longer in service. I'd slipped his phone into the pocket of his burial suit three months previous, and those first iPhones had a battery life of only 250 hours, even in standby mode, which meant that phone had to be as dead as he was. But it rang. It had no business ringing. Reality was totally against the idea, but beneath the ground of Elm Cemetery, three miles away, Tammy Wynette was singing Stand By Your Man. Halfway through the fifth ring, his slightly scratchy old man's voice was in my ear, the same as always, straight to business, not even inviting his caller to leave a number or a message. I'm not answering my phone now. I will call you back if it seems appropriate. The beep came and I heard myself talking. I don't remember thinking about the words. My mouth seemed to be operating completely on its own. I got beat up tonight, Mr. Harrigan, by a big stupid kid named Kenny Anko. He wanted me to shine his shoes, and I wouldn't. I didn't snitch on him because I thought that would end it. I was trying to think like you, but I'm still worried. I wish I could talk to you. I paused. I'm glad your phone is still working, even though I don't know how it can be. I paused. I miss you. Goodbye. I ended the call. I looked in recents to make sure I had called. His number was there along with the time, 11.02 p.m. I turned off my phone and put it on the night table. I turned off my lamp and was asleep almost at once. That was on Friday night. The next night, or maybe early on Sunday morning, Kenny Anko died. He hung himself, although I didn't know that or any of the details for another year. The obituary for Kenny James Yanko wasn't in the Lewiston Sun until Tuesday, and all it stated was passed away suddenly as the result of a tragic accident. But the news was all over the school on Monday, and of course the rumor mill was in full operation. He was huffing glue and died of smoke. He was cleaning one of his daddy's shotguns. Mr. Yanko was said to have a regular arsenal in his house, and it went off. He was playing Russian roulette with one of his daddy's pistols and blew his head off. He got drunk, fell down the stairs, and broke his neck. None of these stories were true. Billy Bogan was the one who told me as soon as he got on the short bus. He was all but bursting with the news. He said one of his ma's friends from Gates Falls had called and told her. The friend lived across the street and had seen the body coming out on a stretcher with a parcel of Yankos surrounding it. Crying and screaming. Even expelled bullies had people who loved them, it seemed. As a Bible reader, I could even imagine them rending their clothes. I thought immediately and guiltily of, all, of the call I'd made to Mr. Harrigan's phone. I told myself he was dead and couldn't have had anything to do with it. I told myself that even if stuff like that were possible outside of comic book horror stories, I hadn't specifically wished Kenny died. I just wanted to be left alone, but that seemed somehow lawyerly. And I kept remembering something Mrs. Grogan had said the day after the funeral when I called Mr. Harrigan a good guy for putting us in his will. Not so sure about that. He was square dealing all right, but he didn't want to be on his bad side. Dusty Billadeau had gotten on Mr. Harrigan's bad side, and surely Kenny Yanko would have been too for beating me up when I wouldn't shine his effing boots. Only Mr. Harrigan no longer had a bad side. 
I kept telling myself that. Dead people don't have bad sides. Of course, phones that haven't been charged for three months can't ring and then play messages or take them either. But Mr. Harrigan's had rung and I had heard his rusty old man voice. So I felt guilty, but I also felt relieved. Kenny Anka would never come back on me. He was out of my road. Later that day during my free period, Miss Harginson came down to the gym where I was shooting baskets and took me into the hall. You were moping in class today, she said. No, I wasn't. You were, and I know why, but I'm going to tell you something. Kids your age have a Ptolemic view of the universe. I'm young enough to remember. I don't know what Ptolemy was, a Roman mathematician and astrologer who believed the Earth was the center of the universe, a still point everything else resolved around. Children believe their entire worlds revolve around them. That sense of being at the center of everything usually starts to fade by the time you're 20 or so, but you're a long way from that. She was leaning close to me, very serious, and she had the most beautiful green eyes. Also, the smell of her perfume was making me a little dizzy. I can see you're not following me, so let me dispense with the metaphor. If you're thinking you had something to do with the Yanko boy's death, forget it. You didn't. I've seen, him, I've seen his records, and he was a kid with serious problems. Home problems, school problems, psychological problems. I don't know what happened, and I don't want to know, but I see a blessing here. What, I asked? That he can't beat me up anymore? She laughed, exposing teeth as pretty as the rest of her. There's that telemic view of the world again. No, Craig. The blessing is that he was too young to get a license. If he'd been old enough to drive, he might have taken some other kids with him. Now go back to gym and shoot some baskets. I started away, but she grabbed my wrist. Wrist. Eleven years later, I can still remember the electricity I felt. Craig, I can never be glad when a child dies, not even a bad actor like Kenny Anko, but I can be glad it wasn't you. Suddenly, I wanted to tell her everything, and I might have done it, but just then the bell rang. Classroom doors opened, and the hall was full of chattering kids. Miss Harginson went her way, and I went mine. That night, I turned on my phone and at first just stared at it, gathering my courage. What Mrs. Harginson had said that morning made sense, but Miss Harginson didn't know that Mr. Harrigan's phone still worked, which was impossible. I hadn't had a chance to tell her and, I, and believed, erroneously as it turned out, that I never would. It won't work this time, I told myself. If I had one last spurt of energy, that's lull, like a light bulb that flashes bright ju just before burning out. I hid his contact, expecting, hoping, actually, for a silence or a message telling me the phone was no longer in service. But it rang. And after a few more rings, Mr. Harrigan was once more in my ear. I'm not answering my phone now. I will call you back if it seems appropriate. It's Craig, Mr. Harrigan. Feeling foolish talking to a dead man, one who would be growing mold on his cheeks by now. I had done my research, you see. At the same time, not feeling foolish at all. Feeling scared, like someone treading on unhallowed ground. Listen, I licked my lips. You didn't have anything to do with Kenny Anko dying, did you? If you did, um, knock on the wall? I ended the call. I waited for a knock. Nothing came. The next morning, I had a message from Pirate King One, just six letters, A-A-A-C-C-X. Meaningless. It scared the hell out of me. That autumn, I thought a lot about Kenny Anko. The current story making the rounds was that he had fallen from the second floor of his house while trying to sneak out in the middle of the night. I thought even more about Mr. Harrigan and about his phone, which I now wished I'd thrown into Castle Lake. There was a fascination, okay? The fascination with strange things we all feel forbidden things. On several occasions, I almost called Mr. Harrigan's phone, but I never did, at least not then. Once I'd found his voice reassuring, the voice of experience and success, the voice, you could say, of the grandfather I'd never had. Now I couldn't remember that voices, that voices it had been on our sunny afternoons talking about Charles Dickens or Frank Norris or D.H. Lawrence or how the internet was like a broken water main. Now all I can think of was the old man rasp, like sandpaper, that's almost worn out, telling me he would call me back if that seemed appropriate. And I thought of him in his coffin. The mortician from Hay and Peabody had no doubt gummed down his eyeballs. But how did that last, that gum last? Were his eyes open down there? Were they staring up into the dark as they rotted in their sockets? A week before Christmas, Reverend Mooney asked me to come into the vestry so we could have a chat. He did most of the chatting. My father was worried about me, he said. I was losing weight and my grades had slipped. Was there anything I wanted to tell him? I thought it over and decided there might be. Not everything, but some of it. If I tell you something, can it stay between us? As long as it doesn't have to do with self-harm or a crime, a serious crime, the answer is yes. I'm not a priest, and this isn't the Catholic confessional, but most men of faith are good at keeping secrets. So I told him that I'd had a fight with a boy from school, a bigger boy named Kenny Yanko, and he'd beat me up pretty good. I said I never wished Kenny dead, and I'd certainly not prayed for it, but he had died, almost right after our fight, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I told him what Miss Harginson had said about how kids believed everything had to do with them and how it wasn't true. I said that helped a little, but I still thought I might have played a part in Kenny's death. The reverend smiled. Your teacher was right, Craig. Until I was eight, I avoided stepping on sidewalk cracks so I wouldn't inadvertently break my mother's back. 
Seriously? Seriously, he leaned forward. His smile went away. I will keep your confidence if you will keep mine. Do you agree? Sure. I'm good friends with Father Ingersoll of St. Anne's in Gates Falls. That is the church the Yankos attend. He told me that the Yanko boy committed suicide. I think I gasped. Suicide had been one of the rumors going around in the week after Kenny died, but I had never believed it. I would have said the, the thought of killing someone, himself had never crossed the bullying son of a bee's mind. Reverend Mooney was still leaning forward. He took one of my hands in both of his. Craig, do you really believe that boy went home, thought to himself, oh my goodness, I beat up a younger kid and smaller than me. I guess I'll kill myself. I guess not, I said, and I let out a breath. It felt like I'd been holding for two months. Would you put it like that? How did you do it? How did you do it? I didn't ask, and I wouldn't tell you, even if Pat Ingersoll had told me. You need to let things go, Craig. The boy had problems. His need to beat you up was only one symptom of those problems. You had nothing to do with it. And if I'm relieved that, you know, I don't have to worry about him anymore, I'd say that was you being human. Thanks. Do you feel better? Yes. And I did. Not long before the end of the school year, Miss Harginson stood before her earth science class with a big smile on her face. You guys probably thought you were going to be rid of me in two weeks, but I have some bad news. Mr. De Les Lessips, the high school biology teacher, is retiring and I've been hired to take his place. You could say I'm graduating from middle school to high school. A few kids groaned theatrically, but most of us applauded, and no one clapped harder than I did. I would not be leaving my love behind. To my adolescent mind, it seemed like fate, and in a way, it was. I also left Gates Falls Middle behind and started the ninth grade at Gates Falls High. That was where I met Mike Uberoff, known then as he is in his current career as a backup catcher for the Baltimore Orioles as Ubo. Jocks and more scholarly types don't mix much at Gates. I imagine it's true at most high schools because jocks tend to be clannish. And if I hadn't been for arsenic and old lace, I doubt if we would ever have become friends. U-Boat was a junior and I was just a lowly freshman, which made becoming friends even more unlikely. But we did, and we remain friends to this day, although I see him far less. Many high schools have a senior play, but that wasn't the case at Gates. We had two plays each year, and although they were put on by the drama club, all students could audition. I knew the story because I'd seen the movie version on TV one sat rainy Saturday afternoon. I enjoyed it, so I tried out. Mike's girlfriend, a drama club member, talked him into trying out, and he ended up playing the homicidal Jonathan Brewster. I was cast as a scurrying sidekick, Dr. Einstein. That part was played by Peter Lore in the film, and I tried my best to sound like him, sneering, yas, yas, before every line. It wasn't a very good imitation, but I have to tell you that the audience ate it up. Small towns, you know. So that's how U-Boat Bo and I became friends, and it's also how I found out what had really happened to Kenny Anko. The reverend turned out to be wrong, and the newspaper obituary turned out to be right. It really had been an accident. During the break between Act 1 and Act 2 of our dress rehearsal, I was at the Coke machine, which had eaten up my 75 cents without giving me anything in return. Yubo left his girlfriend, came over, and gave the machine's upper right corner a hard whack with the palm of his hand. A can of Coke promptly fell into the retrieval tray. Thanks, I said. No prob. You just have to remember to hit it right there in the corner. I said I would do that, although I doubted I could hit it with the same force. Hey, listen, I heard you had some trouble with that Yanko kid, true? There was no sense denying it. Billy and both girls had blabbed and really no reason to at this late date. So I said, yeah, it was true. You want to know how he died? I've heard about a hundred different stories. Have you got another one? I've got the truth, little buddy. You know who my dad is, don't you? Sure. The Gates Falls Police Force consisted of fewer than two dozen uniformed officers, the chief of police, and one detective. That was Mike's father, George Uberoff. I'll tell you about Yanko if you, if you let me hit your soda. Okay, but don't backwash. Do I look like an animal? Give it to me, you effing cheesecake. Yas, yas, I said, doing Peter Lore. He snickered, took the can, downed half of it, then belched. Down the hall, his girlfriend stuck a finger in her mouth and mimed puking. Love in high school is very sophisticated. My dad was the one who investigated, you both said, handing the can back to me. And a couple of days after it happened, I heard him talking to Sergeant Polk from the house. That's what they call the cop shop. They were out there on the porch drinking beers, and the Sarge said something about Yanko doing the choky, strokey. Dad laughed and said he'd heard it called a Beverly Hills necktie. The Sarge said it was probably the only way the poor kid could get off with a pizza face like that. My dad goes, yeah, sad but true. Then he said what bothered him was the hair. Sad it said it bothered the corner, too. What about his hair, I said, I asked, and what's a Beverly uh, Hills necktie? I looked it up on my phone. It's slang for autoerotic asphyxiation. He said the words carefully, with pride almost. You hang yourself and beat off while you're passing out, he said, my expression, and shrugged. 
I don't make the news, Dr. Einstein. I just reported. I guess it's supposed to be an extremely big thrill, but I think I'll pass. I thought I would too. What about the hair? I asked my dad about that. He didn't want to tell me, but since I'd heard the rest, he eventually did. He said half of Yanko's hair had turned white. I thought about that. 